Bakasha, we'll get started. It's a it's eleven away. I do apologize for uh, this. Hopefully, for the one o'clock class today, but Jennifer Raskis will be fixed. But uh, if not, come in through Zoom, and uh, we'll do our best to get us working. Okay. So, Dr. Reinhold, uh, a pleasure. Part three, Achron Achman Chaviv, the psychology of Chuba. Bakasha. Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, glad you could make it. Um, and uh, we are. I'm going to look today at kind of the final piece of this, this sort of um, puzzle. Uh, we started off with uh, the sort of medieval setup, right? So two weeks ago, we had this medieval conception of, of tuba, uh, very past focused, very much focused on uh, sorrow. Uh, even the term that's used in a number of places is, is even depression. Um, focused very much on fear of punishment and uh, that hopefully is a motivation to get you to repent uh, and also with a with an ascetic element to it you're supposed to remove the drives that led you to sin and then kind of uproot those traits I suppose you might say um, and that was the the original medieval picture and last week we began to look at kind of a modern response to that uh, by looking in particular at the works of Rav Soloveitchik and a bit of Rav Cook. Uh, and this is sort of um, prompted, I guess, by two things. Number one was that strange thing we looked at last week where Rav Cook at the beginning of Arata Chuva says that, uh, you know, repentance remains this hidden treasure and nobody's ever penetrated its depths. And that makes you wonder, well, why not? There's lots and lots of stuff already written on repentance. So what does he mean by that? And, you know, hopefully we began to see what maybe he meant by that, in as much as he gives us, as does Rav Soloveitchik, they both give us a view of Tshuva that is a lot less past focused, that um, doesn't actually even mention punishment and the world to come, at least in what we saw. That's not to say they don't mention it at all, of course they do, but uh, their focus on that is incredibly limited, incredibly limited. Um, it comes up in kind of a couple of pages in a 300 uh, page uh, work on Chuva, uh, uh, kind of on repentance of, of Rav Soloveitchik, for example. So it's a very, very different view. So already they're revealing other aspects of Chuva. And last week in particular, we looked at uh, the way that both of them deal with, with time. So we looked at kind of the, the sort of metaphysics of this, the global metaphysics, and it's sort of um, prompted by the other question or problem, which is the injustice, the apparent injustice of tshuva, right? You've done something wrong and you should be punished for it. And God just says, oh, all right, let's get away with it. And that just seems to be something wrong with that. Right. In the same way that you wouldn't expect a judge in a court say, oh, you know what, I know you did wrong, but hey, you said, sorry, I guess fine. Um, you know, we, we, we won't punish you at all. That just seems wrong. There seems to be an injustice there. And yet, when you look at this uh, new conception of time that both Rav Soloveitchik and Rav Cook are, are giving to us, you can begin to understand how this might be because they're very much focused, as we saw last time, um, on the kind of psychological journey you have to go through, whereby you can, and again, it's in quotation marks, change the past, right? So last week we were kind of focused on this notion of time, that there are two different notions. There's quantitative time, which is the version of time that we would um deal with or that we would utilize if we're in a laboratory for example if we're doing math or if we're doing science right i do an experiment it goes wrong i can't go back in time and change it right there is quantitative time right it's time just ticks along the past is the past etc and that's absolutely true on the other hand there is also qualitative time and that is not to dispute the existence of quantitative time it's just to talk about the way we experience time or the way we view time from different perspectives depending on the context right and we gave the musical example last week 
whereby every second isn't just a discrete second, but brings in its train all the stuff in the past and what's coming in the future. That's how we hear music, right? We hear a tune because the discrete note isn't a discrete note. It contains within it all the notes you heard up to then and the anticipation of what's to come. That's how we experience it. So qualitative time is this other notion of time, right? Both are true. This isn't kind of to say, oh, one is correct and the other is not correct. Each is correct in its correct context. And by utilizing this qualitative version of time, both Ralph Soloveitchik and Ralph Cook, Ralph Cook in a more um, sort of mystical way, but both of them believe we can change the past in as much as what our past actions ultimately yield depends on what we do with them now, depends on the continuation of the story. How do we continue the story? Right, that's the key. That's qualitative time as opposed to quantitative time. And in that case, the thing that you did in the past that was the terrible sin suddenly, you know, takes on or is subject to a new description. Right. And that's kind of what we focused on last time. Today, I want to uh, dig a little deeper into the psychology of this. So on the one hand, there's time and the nature of time and how we understand it. On the other hand, and in part, this is something that, that did come up last time anyway, but I want to look a little bit more at the psychology of this process for one thing. And the other thing is that I want to look also at the, um, the piece that we haven't really dealt with yet um, of the medieval picture, which is the asceticism, the uprooting your desires and getting rid of those character traits. So and by the end of this, therefore, Hopefully you'll have a complete picture of tshuva as understood by these 20th century thinkers that hits all of those notes that we struck when we were looking at the medieval picture. OK, um, so just to begin with uh, and to show you that uh, this isn't all just in my imagination, <laughs> there's a lovely headline. Right. Um, and if we were to actually, if we were to go back, right, to the very beginning of this and the very first text, I think, probably that we looked at, uh, indeed, it is the very first text that we looked at. Um, let me share it with you. Uh, we will um, see it once more. Right. So the, the headline. The headline for Rabbeinu Yana's view of repentance was, as you have here, the levels of repentance and their stature is based on the greatness of the bitterness and power of grief. That is repentance comes by purification of soul, soul purity of intellect, right? So there are, you know, different levels of repentance. You can repent to a greater or lesser degree and it can be more effective, less effective. For Rabbeinu Yana, as we saw, and as we started off with this very quote, the level is proportional to the sorrow, the grief, the, you know, others do, do, do um, um, translate this as depression, yeah, God el um, that's repentance, right, that's his headline. Um, the headline that you find in Rav Soloveitchik couldn't be more opposed, right, so just to, you know, show you that this is indeed something that I think is, is completely based in the text of those things we're looking at. Have a look at this um, opposing view where Rav Soloveitchik writes that the very term repentance, literally return, is not remorse or acknowledgement and does not depend upon depression or a sense of despair. Right, so you genuinely couldn't get a more diametrically opposed statement than the levels of repentance depend on God el Hamri on the kind of the bitterness, the sorrow, the grief, as, uh, you know, this couldn't be more opposed. It does not depend upon depression or a sense of despair. That's not what it is, right? Instead, it's return and restoration. And in terms of the psychology of this return, um, I, if people can, if people, you know, uh, want to virtually put their hands up because once I'm sharing the screen, I can't see you all. Um, but I don't know if anybody actually watched Tapestry the episode of Star Trek The Next Generation that I encouraged you all to watch last time. Obviously, there's no homework here and you don't have to, but um, 
if you did then you will recognize this and if you don't then spoiler alert um Ralph Salvechik talks about the psychology of tshuva and says the following right sometimes one will erase certain years of a lifetime so you know one way to do tshuva is to erase those years right and here he's talking clearly about a personality who has been maybe mired in a way of life that they uh, you know subsequently regret and are trying to to come back from right so every single human being has moments and things that they kind of regret he's talking here more generally about somebody who maybe has been through uh, something rather more than that right and with that what can you do well some people erase certain years of their lifetime right he goes on when one blots out a part of his past he also severs part of his being his path shrinks, his personality is dwarfed. An operation of this sort is easily carried out. I have seen penitents do just that. And the consequence? They become different and estranged from their families and friends who appear to them to belong to another eon, a different world, a period when they were entrenched in sin, which has now been erased from their consciousness. All feelings and experiences connected with that period were dead to them. To such an extent, they even severed all ties with their parents, children, brothers, sisters. So one form of repentance is to remove the offending item from your life's history, right? So you can try and erase it, whether that's an act or whether that's a whole, you know, raft of acts, years, whatever it might be. Now that's one way of doing it. And can it be done? Yes. Is it done? Yes. But look what Rav Soloveitchik goes on to say, repentance of this sort leaves a man with only a limited sense of feeling of return, returns to his starting point to where he stood prior to embarking upon the road of sin, and everything that has occurred in the meantime disappears as if it had never been. The Holy One, blessed be he, then recompenses him for this loss by pardoning his sin and raising it from the books, right? So you can immediately see there that Rav Soloveitchik saying, well, you know, is this a form of repentance? It is. Right. Can it be effective as repentance? Well, it can in as much as, and once again, what's the focus here? The Holy One pardons his sin. So this is very much the forgiveness punishment thing, right? Yeah, you'll be okay if you do this. You've got rid of it. God will erase it and you're back where you started, all right? So this is not to say this is not a legitimate, effective form of repentance. However, for us, sort of H, clearly, it's problematic, right? Your past shrinks, your personality is dwarfed. There's something about this that, that is maybe, um, you know, not as effective as another route. And what is that other route? So he goes on, this is the first way of repentance, but there is another way. Not by annihilating evil, but by rectifying it and elevating it. This repentance does not entail making a clean break with the past or obliterating memories. It allows man at one and the same time to continue to identify with the past and still return to God in repentance. Sin is not to be forgotten, blotted out, or cast into the depths of the sea. On the contrary, sin has to be remembered. It's the memory of sin that releases the power within the inner depths of the soul of the penitent to do greater things than ever before. As in, there is this form of repentance where you surgically remove the act, acts, years, whatever it might be, from your personal history. But, says Ralph Soloveitchik, that can only ever lead to a limited feeling of return towards your personality, can have effects on friends, family, etc. from that period. For Ralph Soloveitchik, at any rate, the more, shall we say, psychologically healthy and even effective form of repentance, is one where you don't do that. And what you do instead is you utilize that sin and you utilize it in order to, as he puts it here, release the power within the end depths of soul to do greater things than ever before. This is the idea of the Balchuva, right? The penitent person being greater than the Sadiq Gamora, than the perfectly righteous person, precisely because that energy right the, the passions that led you to sin are very powerful getting rid of them 
will hamper that power, the passionate power. Redirecting them, keeping them, right? Keeping them, not blotting them out, but somehow utilizing them for the good, that's much more powerful. Okay, and the the Star Trek example is from this episode tapestry is that somebody basically gets another chance. The captain who does something in the past where he was a bit of a rabble rouser and he ended up um, stabbing, getting stabbed actually, um, but getting in a fight. And he regrets it and thinks, you know, that wasn't the way to do things. And he gets a second chance and they send him back to the past and he does everything to avoid that situation. And he manages, they replay the history, he does it all differently, he avoids the fight. And the second he avoids that fight from the past, they fast forward back to the present. And instead of being the captain, he's just a knock shepherd doing nothing and, you know, not able to do anything. And he meets his superior in this new kind of timeline. He says, well, I've always felt I could do more, right? I can be a captain, because he knows he was once a captain. And he says, yeah, you never really, though, kind of, you know, quite had the gumption for that. You never quite followed through. And the, the point being that he'd changed that one act in the past. And what that had done, precisely because he got rid of the act he did, it led him down a completely different path. Because he wasn't the kind of person who would get in a fight. All right, it's not the kind of person who would get in the fight in the first place. Maybe you're not going to be fit to be the great commander who leads troops into battle, etc. Instead, the lesson he learns is no, no, it wasn't that I shouldn't have got in the fight. It's that having got in the fight, what I do with those personality traits, what I do with that passion that I had, has to be redirected, not blotted out. And that's exactly what Rob Soloveitch is talking about here. And he believes is exactly what Resh Lakish is talking about in this very, very famous, these kind of two quotes about Chuva, right, um, from, from Yoma, where he says, Yama Resh Lakish, Kedola Chuva, Shes Donat Nasot Lakish Gagot, right? The first kind of saying, you know, repentance is great. Why? Because intentional sins become unintentional sins. Right. And then, you know, they go through with a kind of um, a, a, a proof text or not. And then we get the second immediate um, saying of Resh Lakish, which is right. But instead, that greatest truth are not that intentional sins become unintentional, but they become virtues. Right. Now, the Talmud sorts this out by saying, look, the former is repentance out of fear, the latter is repentance out of love. Fine. This is Rav Soloveitch, right? He says, look, the first one, if I'm blotting stuff out, that's repentance out of fear. Yeah, that's what Resh Lakish is talking about in as much as what am I worried about there? I'm worried about being pardoned for my sins. So what do I do? I erase it, God pardons me, and all is well. But the greater form the form where what I did in the past isn't an error and an error that I erase, but is actually a virtue, is when I use that self-same act and those self-same desires, and I don't erase them, but I use them as fuel for greatness, right? Then they're virtues, then they're not mistakes, they're actually positive. You can use these as a positive right and this is really absolutely key to the psychological process again you know that Ralph Soloveitchik thinks is the most beneficial um indeed the the best way to try and deal with your past sins now of course again there is one qualification here which is there are sins so grievous that it might not be entirely possible to do that, right? It might be possible to utilize the, the, the energies for even if you've done something dreadful for the good, but what you'll never ever be able to do necessarily is completely, so to speak, forgive yourself or come to terms with the terrible thing you did. That's entirely possible, right? Uh, nonetheless, what you can try and do is utilize that passion, that energy moving forward to do something positive and to do something not just you know positive but something great 
right? It's only when you have those drives that you can really turn to greatness. But those, those are powerful drives, powerful passions. And therefore, you know, likelihood is at some point in your life, they might have led to something negative. It's redirecting, sublimating that will allow you to take them forward. And this is what Russell of Egypt wants. And the reason this is important, just to turn briefly to Ralph Cook, is precisely because the kind of chuva where you are so upset about your past and what you've done that you want to erase it in itself reduces the power of personality and reduces the power that you have what Ralph Cook calls your life force. Have a look at what he says here, which is really, you know, he really um, expresses this probably in the most radical way that I've come across in contemporary kind of Jewish uh, thought. So he starts off this from Orata Tshuva, uh, chapter eight. One must be very careful not to fall into depression to the extent it will prevent the light of Tshuva from penetrating to the depths of one's soul. For then the depression may spread like a malignant disease throughout body and soul, for sin grieves the heart and causes depression to settle over the festering bitterness of the agitations of Tshuva. Though it has melancholy elements, they're like a cleansing fire that purges the soul, sustains it on a basis of constant natural joy appropriate to its state. Right? So, of course, there's regret. Right? It's part and parcel of Tshuva. But you have to be very, very careful not to allow that to just overcome you such that the cleansing fire piece doesn't work. Right? And this is very much, I think, the difference between the Rabbeinu Yonah view and the kind of contemporary view that we're looking at. The Rabbeinu Yonah view seems very much driven by the melancholy, whereas for the Rav, Rav Soloveitchik view, at best, it's a means to an end. Right? But as Rav Cook says in an even uh, kind of more, I guess, surprising statement, Teshuvah necessarily houses within itself a certain weakness that even the strongest of spirits cannot escape. When one contracts one's will and restrains the life force through an inner withdrawal and inclines to avoid all sin, the will to the good also shrinks and the vitality of the virtuous life is also weakened, right? Which I think is a very, very kind of straightforward um, presentation of the type of, you know, view, whether it's Reish Lakish, Ralph Soloveitchik, or Jean-Luc Picard, captain of the USS Enterprise, right? That effectively, what, as soon as you're doing this form of tshuva, which is, involves a contraction of the will, then the will to the good also shrinks, right? It's something that I mentioned last week very briefly, but, you know, the, the, the Nietzschean quote, and of course this was all kicked off by the Nietzschean critique, that to be capable of great good, you must be capable of great evil, right? There's truth to that, and again, capable doesn't mean you do it, right? But to be capable of great good, to have the kind of passion to really produce greatness, you know, those passions are these, if they're not tutored, are these kind of broiling and powerful drives that, you know, if, they, if we don't or if we're not able to sublimate them, but it can be dangerous, there's no question. But you get rid of them, then you're not doing anything great either. So the trick or the skill or the kind of the practice that these teshuva um, processes are supposed to give us is, you know, how we can sublimate those without destroying them, without weakening ourselves. And he goes on just one more weakening of the will through constant immersion in tshuva is a form of weakening of the body and soul, which requires therapy. Right? Now, nonetheless, it also contains a refinement of spirituality that purifies the spirit and love spreads over every transgression. Right? But when one is repenting, one must delineate carefully what is good and what evil so that the feelings of remorse and agitations of the spirit will cast their negativity only on the evil and not the good. Furthermore, it's necessary to identify the good to be found in the depths of evil and strengthen it with the very same force with which one flees from the evil. Right? So again, be careful 
because getting mired in the depression of tshuva can throw cast a fall or a shadow over the actual the goodness that you could do even more than that as you hear the good to be found in the depths of evil now with Rav Cook, there's a highly mystical way of looking at that with Rav Soloveitchik there's a much more just straightforward psychological way of that the drive drive to great evil right but don't get rid of the drive because then the great goodness ain't coming either right so this is sort of their psychological take on it and what it leads to in terms of actual practical advice of how to do tshuva in Rav Cook just culminates in the following, which is Shiva should always be founded upon mending the future. One should not begin with the past. For if one turns immediately to fixing the past, one will encounter many impediments, which will make the path of Shiva and to closeness to God too difficult. If one concentrates on mending one's deeds, it's certain that divine help will be granted him to mend the past. So again, this is diametrically opposed to the Rabbeinu Yonah view of sorrow and sorrow and sorrow for the past, and then worry that I haven't been sorrowful enough about the past, so let's go and do more, right? This is absolutely the opposite. Yet yeah, if you do that, you might end up with that total melancholy, getting so hung up on the past you can't move forward. No, says Rob Cook, it should always be founded upon mending the future, and then the past will take care of itself, right? So you really here do get um, actual sort of quasi-practical advice about how to go through the process of tshuva in a way that differentiates these modern views from those that we have um, encountered in medieval writings. So you can begin to see how these modern thinkers are trying desperately to avoid to sidestep the critique of religion and, and of repentance in particular as this life denying self negating thing right they're saying you know what yeah it could be that and some versions of repentance maybe are that but what they're trying to highlight is what they take to be the higher forms of religious in our case obviously jewish tshuva which don't do that at all and instead are completely devoted to a positive future forward looking right a forward focused view of tshuva that doesn't make those errors right um and at that point finally when he repents out of love and all of this is repented out of love right love of life love of the world love of even your passions that could lead to bad things as opposed to fear of punishment right there at once shines on him the light from the world of unity where everything is integrated into one whole and in the context of the whole there is no evil at all the evil is joined with the good thus willful wrongs become transformed into real virtues right this is the more mystical version of resh Lakish, right so for rav cook cosmically ultimately everything has to work out right just has to because the world is divine Rav Soloveitchik it's much more of a challenge right it's a challenge to us to try to progress to this level where we can psychologically work through this and if I don't personally do that then there's no guarantee that what I've done will work out you know gumzilla tova right but with Rav Cook there is because he has this kind of um monistic view whereby all is divine and therefore ultimately at the cosmic level it all will work out right Rav Soloveitchik is a little less um optimistic shall we say or maybe just more realistic uh, depending on how into the mystical big pictures you are um okay so that's the kind of the key psychological element but what I want to do for the last 25 minutes or so is set this in its broader context because there are certain elements within the Jewish worldview certainly as Rav Kook and Rav Soloveitchik see the Jewish worldview at any rate 
um, that feed into this and that act as its kind of foundation. And the first is that, and here you'll see again, that this is not only um, in Jewish thought, but Nietzsche himself, right, who the great critic of all of this, who noted, he says, it was Christianity with its resentment against life at the bottom of its heart, which first made something unclean of sexuality. It threw filth on the origin, on the presupposition of our life, right? Nietzsche there pointing out the more kind of ascetic, more negative towards the physical world, be it sexuality or anything else, the kind of negativity towards the physical, towards the world, that all that is great and good is otherworldly, all that is physical and natural within our world is bad, is evil. And Nietzsche identifies uh, kind of Christianity as the origin of that view. Right now, I, I, you know, I am not a scholar of Christian thought, um, so I, I know there are many who, in the same way that I am trying to say Rabbeinu Yonah isn't all the whole story of Jewish tshuva, Mesrov Soloveitchik, Rav Cook, and people would say the same about what Nietzsche's doing here. They would say, well, Nietzsche's right, but that's a form of Christianity, not others. So I, that's, we're not going to get into that, right? But just as a side note, um, there are plenty who might push back in the way that we are from a Christian perspective, kind of in parallel to the way we are from a Jewish perspective. Nonetheless, Nietzsche goes on, affect, great desire, the passion for power, love, revenge, possessions. Moralists want to extinguish and uproot them, to purify the soul of them. Instead of taking into service the great sources of strength, those impetuous torrents of the soul that are often so dangerous and overwhelming and economizing them, this most short-sighted and pernicious mode of thought, the moral mode of thought, wants to make them dry up. That is pretty much Rabbeinu Yonah's advice, right? We should make these things dry up so that then we won't sin. Why? Well, because this world doesn't matter. What matters is the next world. So since it'll all be gone anyway by the end, why bother, right? Let's dry those things up. What Rav Cook and Rav Soloveitchik are saying is exactly what Nietzsche is saying. No, 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 no. Yeah, these are great sources of strength. We need to economize them. We need to utilize them. You don't make them dry up. To make them dry up is to shrink your personality and it's negative, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's notable that Rav Soloveitchik shares this idea that that negative view isn't Jewish, right? Um, he writes, Christians develop a theory of contempt for this world. Indeed, some went further and developed the doctrine of hatred for this world. Judaism did not. The beauty of Judaism is that it did not want to separate this transient temporal world from the eternal transcendental world. Judaism forbade the Jew to hate this world or to have contempt for it. Now, always, of course, when anyone, myself included, says Judaism did this and didn't do that, it's always parts of it, right? You can certainly find elements within our own tradition that are far more ascetic than the view that we're finding here from Rav Soloveitchik, right? But the point is that as far as Rav Soloveitchik is concerned, right, the beauty of Judaism, and no question that there is a, a, an equally powerful strand within our history, uh, within our textual history, that does go in this direction that Rav Soloveitchik is saying, right, which is that we don't have that. Right? We don't have that same type of negation of life, that kind of ascetic view that you find in elements such as Rabbeinu Yonah's view and as he has in Christianity. So everything that we've been looking at so far is uh, um, to be understood within the kind of broader context of these thinkers believing in a deeply anti-ascetic Judaism, right? A Judaism that is not in any way negative towards physical life in this world, that instead sees it as, you know, God's creation and therefore it is good. And therefore what we have to do is, you know, make sure we treat it well and we act correctly within it. 
but it, we don't start off with a negative this is terrible awful therefore we should try and avoid it and we should get rid of our physical desires etc etc because that is to dwarf our personalities um, there's actually something lovely Rob Cook says um, in his writings on repentance um, regarding the uh, uh, the end of the holidays as in Sukkot and Simchat Torah and all of that and he says you know the, the reason for that is precisely because it is inevitable that going through the tshuva process depresses the spirit right so it is we just saw right just above here that tshuva necessarily houses within itself a certain weakness that even the strongest spirits cannot escape right it, it just has to do that it has to bring a level of melancholy even if you do it the right way even if you do it in this life-affirming way that we're seeing here in Rob Crook, Rob Soloveitchik, right? But it's inevitable, it, it weakens. Therefore, says Rob Cook, that's why we have at the end, Zman Simchatenu, the time of our rejoicing, right? It's a, it's a tikkun, so to speak. It's very much intentional that at the end of a process, that even with the best will in the world, and even if you're doing the positive life affirming future kind of forward focused one, right, even with that, there is an element of weakening that will inevitably result. Therefore, what do we have at the end? To kind of open up and let the positivity burst forth and remedy any lingering weakness that you might have as a result of the tshuva process, right? So in Rav Kut, you really do have this kind of holistic view um, as mentioned, whether mystically to do with history or just here to do with the liturgical calendar, right? The cycle of the Jewish holidays is such that we have this and it's necessary, but it has also inevitably a certain negative effect that is immediately remedied by the next holiday. So there's sort of uh, the the grouping here, and the fact that Zman Simchatenu comes immediately afterwards is not accidental for Rav Kook. Okay, one other piece to this, which sets something potentially more more radical um, in front of us, and that explains this context. Right, so the context so far, anti-asceticism, right? We're not negative about the physical. Um, that's how we can utilize everything um, about us in order to try and um, move forward in the tshuva process and not have to uproot anything or uproot desires, okay? Um, a work that came out uh, about uh, after, over a decade after Rav Soloveitchik um, died, uh, from his unpublished manuscripts, was uh, a work called The Emergence of Ethical Man. Uh, the Emergence of Ethical Man was, of all the unpublished works, probably the one that, that was uh, um, closest to being an actual complete work. It was found in a set of kind of notebooks that were bound together. So this was clearly a work that was intended to be a monograph to come out. And when it came out, it was seen as, by some people, as his most radical work. Um, there was an, a review of the work that came out by Yoram Hazoni, and the title of his review was The Rav's Bombshell. I thought this was a bombshell. What was that bombshell? Right? We'll have a look at the bombshell. Um, he begins right at the beginning of the work, right? Um, he turns, as he often does, to Bereshit to the very beginning, to, you know, that for him is, is just an Ura text for so much um, uh, that, that makes up the Jewish worldview, in his opinion. Um, so, you know, from lowly man of faith to confrontation to now the ethical man, this is a text he returns to and returns to. In the emergent ethical man, he's trying to do something less fine grained than he does in Lonely Man of Faith, something with a more kind of global, um, more to do with a global outlook. As he puts it here, our task now 
he writes, is to investigate the cogency of the almost dogmatic assertion that the Bible proclaimed the separateness of man from nature and his otherness, right? So Russell Page is claiming there is a dogmatic assertion. What is that assertion? The assertion is that the Tanakh, the Torah, right, proclaims a complete separation between man on the one hand and nature on the other. There's nature, and then man is completely other, right? Completely other than nature, whether, whether to do with a soul that cannot be um, accounted for physically, right? Man is other, something different. He tells us, it is certain that the fathers of the church and also the medieval Jewish scholars believed that the Bible preached this doctrine. Medieval and even modern Jewish moralists have almost canonized this viewpoint. Yet the consensus of many, however great and distinguished, does not prove the truth or falseness of a particular belief. I've always felt that due to some erroneous conception, we've actually misunderstood the Judaic anthropology and read into the biblical texts ideas which stem from an alien source. Ralph Soloveitchik, in part one of this work, argues for the naturalness of humanity. He sees the story at the beginning of Brashit as a continuum, right? We start with simple things. We come to more complex physical beings, right? Whether, you know, plants, animals, ultimately humans, but it is a continuum for him. It is not that you get to animals and then there's suddenly a break and we get this miraculous new thing that's completely other called humanity. No, for Ralph Soloveitchik, it's a continuous process. And we are just the most complex of all of those beings, but we aren't actually other. And he's talking here biologically, right? If you're looking biologically, human beings are just another piece of biology as are Jews, nothing special. Biologically speaking, physically speaking, about Jews, which to many people was a shocker because you know there are many who believe no, no, no there's something other like a Jewish soul or you know some kind of neshama, whatever it might be, that separates us. And Rob Soloveitchik in this work argues very strongly against that, and he writes, "Man in the story of creation does not occupy a unique ontic position." Right, so he isn't unique in the in the um, ladder of existence. Right, human beings might well be at the pinnacle, right? Because they're the most complex, with the biggest brains, who did all you know this, made all of this. But that isn't because they're somehow separate from nature, because they have some magical quality that no other physical being has. Right. Instead, it's just you know more of the same. It's a quantitative, not a qualitative distinction, right? Our brains were, you know, bigger and better and enabled us to do more things. That for Russell of H, that's it. So he goes on, right? He is rather a drop in the cosmos that fits into the schemata of naturalness and concreteness. The Torah presents to us a successive order of life emergence and divides it into three phases. The last of those living structures is man. The viewpoint is very much akin to modern science. Christianity splits the story of creation in two and analyze the story of man without taking cognizance of that of animal and plant. That is why I arrived at half truths and misrepresented the biblical anthropology. This is ultimately the kind of the broadest foundation for everything that we've been looking at. At the end of the day for Rav Soloveitchik, human beings are part of nature. Right. What separates us from nature, as far as the rough is concerned, has nothing to do with some ghostly substance that somehow gets into our minds or brains or souls or whatever. That's not what separates us. What separates us is morality. What separates us is the fact that we have these moral commands and we have the freedom to obey or disobey that we can therefore create value in this world, create goodness or badness, right? If you watch a nature documentary and you see a lion eating an antelope, 
you don't say that's morally despicable. How can the line do that? You should be up in court for this murder. We don't, right? That's a, that is unique. We are unique. It's not saying we're not unique. It's just our uniqueness does not reside in some kind of magical ghostly soul. It resides in the fact that as intellectual beings with free will, we have been presented with a choice as to whether we live a good life or a bad life, or we do good things or bad things. That is what separates us. And as Jews, obviously, a very particular way of living that good life. That's what, that's what we have, and that is what separates us. So what does that mean? Well, that means that obviously human beings as part of nature, right? The physical world is a good, right? It's a good thing, it's a good place. It's not that all value resides in some other realm. No, 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 value resides here. And it's up to us whether we enact and embody that value in our world, that is up to us, right? We can create a world that is a moral good world or an appalling and dreadful world, right? That is on us. But it's all about what we're doing here, right? It's not, we don't just do it to store up brownie points for Alam Haba. We do it because we have been charged to do it here, right? So that's kind of the big picture, kind of anthropologically, as he says. And that leads to anti asceticism. Right? We're not ascetics, and instead the physical is good. And that leads to a view of repentance, which is focused on what we do in the here and now, how we rectify in a way that will continue to build a world, not how I do things to get rid of a punishment that might you know, affect me in some afterlife or whatever. That's not the focus. It's all driven by this quasi-naturalism, and of course, Russell Vashik is not a naturalist. He believes in this thing called God, right? Not a natural thing at all. So it's not a naturalist, but when it comes to understanding humanity, when it comes to understanding what it is that we're supposed to do, there there's a very, very heavy kind of naturalism that yields a view of tshuva that is this worldly focused, focused on real human drives and desires, focused on a reparation that will allow us to continue and improve our lives here and now for us and for others, not something that's focused on um, destructive psychological navel gazing that is completely egotistical because it's all about whether I'm gonna get punished. Right. So you see kind of there's this whole picture that fits together in the same way as Rabbeinu Yonah's whole picture fits together very consistently. These are two consistent pictures. Right? The world is not important. What matters is the next world, which means what I should focus on is my punishment in the next world, which means I should be very depressed about what I've done and hope God miraculously forgives me. Very completely consistent picture. Or the Torah talks of this world and creates us in this world because this world matters. And therefore, this world and all our drives within it have to be utilized and marshaled for the best possible progress in this world, which means Teshuvah is all about doing that and going through that process in order to improve. Right? Two consistent pictures. And that leads to a version of religion and of tshuva that can't really be accused of the things that the picture was accused of at the beginning of the modern period, right? When Spinoza and Nietzsche are decrying this religious notion of tshuva for reducing all that is great and good to otherworldly things, for denigrating human humanity, you might, might, be able to level that critique at certain conceptions of tshuva we have in our history. But you simply can't level it at the version of tshuva that we've seen over these couple of weeks, Rav Kook and Rav Soloveitchik present to us. Instead, actually, what you get 
in both of these things. If there's a view of Truvan at the bottom of the page here, I will raise it shortly. Um, I taught them, this quote says, to work on the future and to redeem with their creation all that has been, to redeem what is past in man and to recreate all it was until the will says, thus I willed it, thus I shall will it. This I called redemption. This alone I taught them to call redemption. Right? Now, given everything we've said in these last few weeks, it wouldn't be a surprise if that appeared in Halachic Man or on Repentance, right? That's exactly what Ralph Soloveitch is teaching us. Work on the future to redeem all that has been, right? Ralph Cook, mend the future and that will take care of the past, right? Redeem the past, recreate it so that it all, all it was is thus I willed it, right? That's what we're aiming at. I want that it was, that sin, to be a thing that is now accounted as one of my schuyot, that's Resh Lakish, right? I want that past to be redeemed to the point that I now can say, you know what? I know I did that. And yes, at the time, it's a bad thing, but you know what? Right now, I've kind of redeemed it. The fact I did that has led me to what I am now. And if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be what I am now. So, you know, there's a sense in which thus I willed it. That is redemption. But the point is that's not Rav Soloveitchik, it's not Rav Kook, that's Nietzsche, right? That's Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. That's the positive thing that he's putting forward. And the positive thing he's putting forward ultimately is exactly the version of Tshuva that you find in Rav Soloveitchik and Rav Kook. In Rav Soloveitchik, we actually you know, do see the quotation where Nietzsche is lauded for getting something right about the critique but just to leave you with this that i'm not the only one uh, benny shalom in uh, his uh, work on rav cook seems to think similarly he writes rather than rejected Nietzsche, rejecting Nietzsche's claims rav cook accepted some of his seemingly basic assumptions Nietzsche's basic interest the aggrandizement of selfhood becomes rav cook's own yet he proposed a truly alternative view right so again, the idea that this, what he's calling here aggrandizement of selfhood, um, which is very much Nietzschean, but he's saying, yeah, Ruff could accept this, he absorbed this, he gave, gives an alternative view, of course, right? It's a view which is where we're subject to all kinds of commands, right? Mitzvot, believe me, that's not Nietzschean at all, but the basic orientation of the two of them, of Ruff Cook and Ralph Soloveitchik, does seem to give us a picture of Tshuva that even one of Tshuva's most virulent critics could have probably um, accepted. And I will, with that, stop sharing um, and have a look at any questions. Let me go to the chat. Okay, hello. <laughs> I've been working getting the site up, but Baruch Hashem, we just got the site back up. Oh, good. So, <laughs> so um, whatever. So I don't have any questions. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm going to look through the chat here where we have a few, um, which uh, one is talking about two different viewpoints. One, one more about how God views it, another how the tenant may choose to view it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, one is certainly about how God views it as we mentioned last time, uh, and the other is, the other is whether or not, well, it's not two different viewpoints, it's um, whether or not a human being can get to the point of viewing it that way too, right? So there, I mean, it's too different in as much as God immediately sees it one way, humans see it a different way, 100%. Um, the challenge is whether or not a human being can to the extent possible, which is obviously not remotely possible in kind of in its entirety, but to the extent possible, try to um, act in such a way that reflects that divine viewpoint, right? Understanding that there's got to be something in what I've done that ultimate, ultimately, right, um, is good or leads to good. And to uh, 
act through the process of tshuva in a way that reflects that mindset, I guess. Um, and yeah, the stop trip test such a thing. Um, quick passage about regretting sin, avoiding outrage, depression, or tomato. It's trying to write into Rav Nachman. Yeah, that's um, so Rav Cook famously um, was, uh, he was another, um, as was Rav Soloveitchi actually, both of them were products of mixed marriages, you know, Hasid and Amit Nugget, right? Um, and therefore, they both have. Mm -hmm. Um, within their kind of imbibed from early on, right? Both of these elements, and Rav Cook got much more into the Hasidut and the um, in a, in a more, you know, Rav Soloveitchik often right citing um, more mystical texts as well. But he, on the whole, will will give them a more a slightly more uh, rational psychological interpretation, whereas Rav Cook is much more invested in the in the in the truly mystical um, meanings of those texts um, and the idea that there would be therefore Hasidic literature that plays in quite closely and Rav Nachman amongst them is absolutely the case. Um, okay and let's have a look. The rest is, no I don't think there's anything else here. That's an actual question. Um, uh, somebody confirming the great good and great evil being linked. Um, and yes, the famous thing about the Eight Sahara, right? Can't, without it, can't function. That's exactly the point, right? What you have to do is sublimate it, right? What you have to do is to redirect those energies. That's exactly, 100%, that's um, exactly the point. Um, but yes, that is, um, that is it. Um, okay. Uh, can we download the document you screen shared? I, I will. I will email it to Rabbi Kelman so that it's available. I, I think maybe I did it originally, but I will send it again. We yeah. I, we just have on the website your thing of all the sources. We can always add it. We can just put it on the website on the program page, and that's the best way to download. And that's where the uh, MP3s are. And the, I hope I we got a lot of people who couldn't got in. And you noticed just in, when our website went up, the attendance it jumped up. For the last yeah, like yeah, yeah. like like yeah, ten minutes yeah. of class, because that's uh, anyway. So I I apologize for that. Obviously, these are things beyond our control. That Hakadosh Baruch Hu runs the world, and uh, <laughs> you know, not us. And uh, well, I don't know what the connection between like like Chuva and the uh, proper work websites, but uh, whatever, <laughs> anything. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to recognize. But I want to thank you, wish you a Shana Tova, Kdiva Tova, all the best, and thank you for the series, uh, a pleasure. And yeah, Thank uh, you, everybody, for, for and, uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and wishing yeah. you all a Shana Tova. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And one o'clock today, hopefully everything will be smooth, I hope. Jennifer Raskis will be talking about the series Chuva and Tanach, talking about the Yosef story, reconciliation. Uh, that's today, at one o'clock and 8.30 p.m. Mark Shapiro, his series, Great Rabbinic Thinkers, Shaul Lieberman. Shaul Lieberman, tomorrow morning, Rabbi Adler, Aaron Adler finishes his series on Rav Soloveitchik's uh, re-experience of Rosh Hashanah Rav Soloveitchik. Wednesday morning, uh, Benny Gesundheit finishes his series on Musings on the Machzor, Unatanat Okev. One fifteen, Alex Israel is giving a special shear on uh, what we should uh, focus on when we listen to the shofar. Uh, at eight o'clock, uh, Dr. Sokolow's regular class, the Haftor of the Week. Uh, Thursday, Gil Pearl is on, on Shechianu, um, the Shechianu and Sukkot. And uh, then Rabbi Gemara at one o'clock, or Rod Chuva with Rabbi Schwab. One, and then 8.30, Rabbi Shlomo Gemara here from, from Toronto, those who know him, uh, will be giving our Parshat HaShavush here. And then I'll be giving the Pirkei Avich here, the last of the season, 9.30 Friday morning. So that covers up for the rest of the week. Got the, always lots of stuff going on. So invite a friend. Uh, it's the best way to prepare for us. And I hope uh, people are busy, but uh, we hope to see you soon and learning. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Reinhold. And uh, Bakasha. Okay. Be well, everybody. Bye-bye.